Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And this is all about, Julia, it sounds like a a miscellany of Norse mythology as we close out or get toward the end of our It's Norse, of course, miniseries. Yes. So this is a menagerie of giants, creatures, and monsters from Norse mythology. And as we discussed in our last It's Norse, of course, episode, while there are a lot of gods that are featured in Norse mythology that are part of the Vanir and the Asir, there are also several other gods and goddesses that exist in the folklore that don't really fall into that category. And we've made kind of like passing mention of several of these. And this also includes several of the gods that are also like half Veneer or Asir and then half Jotnar or giant. And some of these are among the most famous of the Norse figures. They are featured heavily in some of the most important and famous stories of the poetic and the prose Eddas. And I'm really excited to talk about them today, Amanda. I, I don't have a like Applebee sampler platter in mind or anything <laughs> like that. But if you want to think of a way to assign them, each of these groups, a interesting like topic or idea or what have you, please let me know because you are a, a genius in that field, in my opinion. Oh, thank you. That's my wacky association to come up with. Uh, You bring the actual knowledge about these figures and stories. So I'll let you know what I come up with as we go. All right. That sounds great. So let's get started with probably the most important group outside of the Vanir and the Asir, and that is the Jotnar. So the Jotnar, which we typically call giants in English, are not really giants, or at least not in the way that we think of where we're thinking of like a really big person, right? Though some of them are, but not like in general, all of them are. So it's really one of those things where Depending on the story, some of them are big, but then some of them are like the same size as the veneer and the Asir. So it's really just like a, we call them giants. Giants means a certain thing in English, but they're not necessarily giants, giants. You know what I mean? Got it. So the Jotnar, which the singular of Jotnar, because Jotnar is plural, is Jotun. This comes from the Proto-Germanic word for devourer and are also somewhat related to trolls in certain translations and descriptions, with troll being a word sometimes used specifically for a male Jotun. Hmm. So... Despite the fact that they are described as very similar to the gods, they are a separate group distinctly different from the Vanir and the Asir. They are said to dwell in Jotunheimer, which is one of the nine realms that make up the branches of the world tree Yggdrasil. And the Eddas describe Jotunheimer as a place with deep, dark forests, mountain peaks where winter never eases its grip, and in general as a land that is fairly inhospitable and kind of grim. Which... I feel like, you know, for me at least, like deep, dark forests and mountain peaks where winter never eases its grip, that's kind of beautiful in a way and kind of like a rugged, like going to explore nature sort of way. You know what I mean? It does. And I think it also implies that the people who flourish there are somewhat mysterious or, you know, big competitors, right? Or people who have a sort of like higher than average, like tolerance or expertise because they flourish in an environment that many of us would probably be happy to like vacation to, Mm. but would probably great on you over time. Yeah, I think that's true. Like it does kind of imply where the Asgardians are kind of living in this like lap of luxury. The Jotnar are kind of like they're just like living rugged, you know what I mean? Like, I'm always picturing them, and I know this is not the right genre at all, like the cowboys of Norse mythology, where it's like, yeah, they're living out in the rough and tumble, you know? Yes, I think that's exactly right. So it is also said that some of the Jotnar lived in places that surrounded the edge of Midgard or the mortal realm, but also it's a singular place like Asgard was. And some stories also placed Jotunheimer in the roots of Yggdrasil rather than among the branches. And like, we'll talk a lot about the sort of geography of Norse mythology in this episode. And like a lot of times it's kind of like, okay, Midgard is in the center of Yggdrasil. Sometimes Asgard is above it. Sometimes Alfheim is above it. And then the rest are kind of below it or surrounding it. And it's like a little confusing because there's no like actual like 
people have drawn maps of the geography of Norse mythology, but at the same time, it's not very specified. Different people have different ideas of what it is. And like I said, the geography of Norse mythology can be a little confusing at times. So you're probably wondering when I say like, oh, Jotunheimer could surround the edges of Midgard. What does that mean? So Real quick, I'm going to introduce you to the concept of Norse society with Inengard and Utengard. So these are not only like geographical spaces, but are also these like psychological states that can be applied to sociopolitical, economic, and religious customs in Norse mythology. Wow. And Norse society as a whole. But for the sake of just talking about geography, because I don't want to get like super, super into it. Inengard refers to a place of order, civilization, and law abiding, where Utengard, on the other hand, is chaos and wilderness. And these names come from within the fence for Inengard and outside of the fence for Utengard. So, for example, Midgard and Asgard are realms that are Inengard, whereas the other seven realms tend to be defined as Utengard. With this being the case, kind of picture that, like, Inengard has edges, like this metaphorical fence, and the realms outside of that are Utengard, which means that Jotunheimer surrounds the edges of Inengard, the fence that creates the Inengard and Utengard, you know? That makes sense to me. Like, the metaphor of a fence really unlocked that in my brain, which mm-hmm. is, like, there is the, you know, the known, the safe, perhaps the, you know, the like me, the non-other that is, like, inside. I'm picturing almost, like, the warm, you know, glow of, like, a village's lights. And then outside is who knows what. And so that makes a little more sense how these could be, like, physical descriptors but also have metaphorical weight. Yeah, and there's this, like, kind of concept of this, like, psychogeography of Inengard and Utengard, which is, like, again, applying the sort of, like, natural agrarian use of land that the Norse would have incorporated in their day-to-day life, separating kind of the pastures and fields of crops from the wilderness beyond them. And so applying this thing that they see on their day-to-day life to the broader universe that makes up their world. And I think that's really, it makes a lot of sense that that would be the way that you kind of define the, the realms and the geography of their mythology and their religion. Totally. So, The Jotnar, now that we've talked about geography a lot, the Jotnar were often portrayed as the enemies of the gods of Asgard in the prose and poetic eddas. But as we've talked about in previous episodes, the two groups also often intermarried, you know? The original Jotun was Ymir, and from Ymir, all the other Jotnar came from. And the Jotnar specifically from Ymir after his death were the frost giants, which are the Hrimthruser, who basically are said to represent the threat of winter and darkness as opposed to kind of like the fertility of the like again we're getting into that in and guard out and guard kind of thing like this is the winter the darkness whereas the inside is the fertility cultivating the land the like manageable wilderness you know what i mean totally so one of the other elder giants from which a lot of the Jotnar are descended from is Burglmir and his wife, whose family were the only surviving Jotnar after the flood that happened after Odin, Vili, and V killed Ymir. If you remember that story, it's basically like Ymir was a literal giant because we know that his skull was used to create the dome that surrounds the world and became the sky. Mm -hmm. And when they killed him, there was a flood that was his blood, but also became the seas. And so Burglmir and his wife and family were the few that survived that great flood. Another great flood story, if you remember from our great floods episode all those years back. So many different cultures have a great flood story. It's great. Seriously. So from them, many of the famous Jotun claim lineage. There is Gerder, who is the giantess wife of the god Freyr, who is described as being the most beautiful of all women and is associated with the earth and fertility. There is Jarn Saxa, who is one of the nine mothers of Heimdall, as we talked about in that previous episode, one of the maidens of the sea, one of the lovers of Thor, and is also the mother of Thor's son Magni, who is like famous 
famously, he was like a three-year-old that just had like a lot of power. And you're like, ah, <laughs> that three-year-old, he shouldn't be so strong. Makes sense for a kid of Thor. <laughs> Even Thor's mother was said to have been a Jotun named Jord, who was the personification of the earth. And then there's also Hrungnir, whose name translates to the brawler, who famously was described as being made of stone and was ultimately killed in a duel by Thor and his magic hammer Mjolnir. And of course, there is Angraboda, who is the lover of Loki, who bore him many monstrous children that we're going to talk about here in this episode, like Frenrir, Jormungandr, and Hel. Ah, Hel. Never forget. Oh, God. Never forget Hel. The single L. We love to see it. Mm -hmm. And then finally, there is the giant Surtur, who we're going to be talking a lot about when we finally get to Ragnarok, but who was said to guard the realm of fire, Muspelheim, and wielded a bright flaming sword, which the imagery, mwah, chef's kiss, so perfect. Incredible. So he's actually really interesting because he is somewhat comparable to Heimdall in that he is the watchman god of the Jotun and will eventually announce the beginning of the final battle to the Jotnar. Important job. Important job. Important job. Like when everyone's getting ready for that final battle in Norse mythology. So the fact that he is going to be the one that announces it to the frost giants, is like kind of a big deal. Yeah, it's like a thing that we're waiting for every day, essentially. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about the waiting for Ragnarok in just a little bit. But mm -hmm. now that we've spoken about some of the more famous Jotun, there are a couple of half Jotun that we've mentioned before that I want to dig a little bit deeper into. And our first being, of course, our girl, Hell. Yay! So a lot of sources do refer to Hel as a goddess, but she is distinctly not Vanir or a seer. And since she is half Jotun, she is not considered one of the gods. Though there are other examples of gods having one Jotun parent and still being embraced by the Vanir and the Asir, like Heimdall being one of them. And I think it really just kind of depends on like who the parents are and whether or not, like, they want to raise them to Asgard or not, which is, like, a little mean, but at the same time, like, eh, you know, it, it's mythology, baby. That's just how it be sometimes. Yeah, this feels like it's very dependent on the situation at hand and not just like, oh, you have one, you know, parent who is Jotun and therefore, you know, it's a non-starter. Yes, exactly. And I think in particular, because Hell's other parent is Loki in most versions, it would make a lot of sense that they're like, yeah, Loki's kids. Nah. Yeah, exactly. So Hell is generally presented as being greedy, harsh, and cruel at her worst, and generally indifferent to the concerns of the living and the dead at her best. However, because her personality is not particularly highlighted in the surviving texts, it is kind of hard to, like, get a good read on her. In the Eddas, she's described as having a face that is split in two, which is, like, really, like, whoo, that's Whoa. really interesting. One side is a greenish black, while the other is a half-livid white, and it has a perpetually grim and fierce expression that never leaves her face. Uh, that sounds killer. I love that. Yeah, so basically her skin is kind of supposed to be like that of the different types of corpses, basically. So oh, like a fresh corpse and yeah. then a rotting corpse. And then a barrel-aged, sort of like cave-aged corpse, yeah. Yes, which I mean like is very fitting giving her association with the dead, right? Yeah. So it is said that in terms of like, let's talk about Hell got to become associated with the dead in the first place. It is said that Odin cast Hell down to the realm of Niflheim, which is the misty realm of cold, darkness, and death, which is another one that is said to be in or under one of the roots of Yggdrasil. Hmm. So again, we're like, we kind of have this idea of like, there's higher, there's middle, there's lower, there's branches, there's the roots. But again, we're not like entirely sure where everything is. Like we have some basic ideas depending on the prose and the poetic Edda, but then other versions place other realms in different spots. So it's a little bit difficult for us to figure out. It's like when someone says space-time continuum to me, and I'm like, mm-hmm, I know what that is. But if you ask me to, like, represent it in any way with my hands or a diagram, I'd be like, I, my brain cannot compute that many lines. <laughs> oh, no. You're like, that's some sci-fi bullshit. I know it's not sci-fi bullshit, but, like, it basically is. I know it's real, but, like, the idea, like, I've seen the diagrams of the planes with the cones and things like that, and I'm just like, I believe it. Uh, I am not going to sort of try too hard to find the edges of that with my brain because it is not going to work. 
Yeah, like I don't need an existential crisis for me to understand that the universe works in ways that I don't understand. And that's fine with me. So I listen to Pale Blue Pod and they take me through it in a way that is comforting and not scary. Exactly. Exactly. I don't want to suffer existential crisis in Mm -hmm. general. So I don't think about space all that much. So in Niflheim, in the roots of Yggdrasil, Hel is tasked to look after the dead that were not honored in Odin's own halls or the halls of the other gods. So these are basically people who either died of sickness or old age, who would not have been brought to Valhalla, but also those who lived dishonorable lives, such as like the corrupt or people that were thieves or things like that nature. So her palace is known as Eljonir, which was said to have exceedingly high walls and great gates, and she had many great possessions there. However, while that sounds really nice, this was not a wonderful hall for the people that arrived there. So Uh she would basically entertain, this is a quote, entertain the dead in a grisly kind of way. Her table was called hunger, her knife starvation, her bed sickness, and the curtains around it misfortune. Some Tim Burton ass shit happening over here. <laughs> now I'm picturing this as a Tim Burton film. It's yeah. very black and white. Yeah. Picturing a claymation for some reason. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, but like almost Coraline esque, I feel like. Yeah. Now I'm picturing Hell as the other mother. And I love that image for me. There you go. It's very cool. I like that a lot. So not a great time spent in the Hall of Hell. And it was also said that during times of plague and famine on Midgard, it was said that Hell left her realm to roam Midgard. She would ride a three-legged white horse and would rake up the survivors of the plague, sweeping them with her broom down to Niflheim to her hall. Oh my, what an image. What is it about the, like, imagery of women sweeping that we kind of associate with, like, negative aspects. Like, obviously, we get witchcraft and the idea of, like, riding a broom and stuff like that. And, like, the kind of, like, I use pagan as a, like, general non-Christian religious beliefs in Europe way. But, like, the idea of, like, using a broom in different customs of, like, non-Christian beliefs. What is it about the broom that we're like, yeah, that's a lady thing, but also bad? To me, I think that it's a sort of like the ultimate domestic object Mm -hmm. where, you know, the broom is daily. You use it every day. Use it, you know, to like keep the dirt of outside out of the domestic sphere. And probably somebody who was higher in class or earning or social privilege, you know, doesn't have to do that monotonous labor. And so I think there is something like culturally off-putting about sort of like perverting this mundane domestic object into, for example, an object of witchcraft in the, you know, kind of like Puritan anti-witchcraft like imagery and beliefs. There is, you know, oh, you don't want, uh, you know, the witches like rode it, you know, astride and like there's, you know, kind of sexual stuff there too. But I think here it is like the kind of ultimate like, not even perversion, but just like extension of that image outside of the realm of the cozy and domestic and productive into like, oh, it's corpses. It's not like dust. Yeah, no, I was just thinking as you were talking about that, the idea of it's very like depersonalizing of the dead, where it's like, ah, this isn't even like, you know, the memory of someone that you loved. No, you've been now discarded. You've been swept away. You're you're just dirt or dust or stuff like that. I really like that, Amanda. That was a a great combination. No, and it's like it's fodder for her. You know, they're not individuals, but there are so many dead and it is so routine to her or perhaps she is so like inured to death that she can just sweep them away like everything else. Yes. And that brings up a great point because for hell, at least, there is no really differentiation between those who are brought to her hall, right? It's almost like we talk about death being the great equalizer. And that is, in fact, true for hell. Because if you'll remember from one of the most famous stories of Norse mythology, the death of Baldur, hell would not allow him to return to the lands of the living unless every living thing weeped for Baldur. And this is like really important to note because Baldur didn't die a hero's death. He sent to hell's realm rather than one of the halls of the gods like Valhalla or something like that. So this is kind of a great equalizer where like because Baldur 
died a certain way, he's the same as anyone else who died who is now in the halls of hell. And I think that's really interesting and really cool that they, like, specify that. And that's why she's so unfeeling. She's like, it doesn't matter the circumstance of your death. If you're here, you're mine. 100%. Also, like, it's worth noting that with the language that I used earlier of Odin casting hell down, he would not be surprised to know that the gods didn't look super highly on her. But she did, in a lot of ways, have more power even than Odin himself. And like Mm. we just talked about with the Baldur story, once someone was in her power, no one, not even Odin, could reclaim that soul unless hell gave her permission. It reminds me in a certain way of Hades, especially that aspect of Hades having, you know, like, yes, you kind of have the most lowly, like literal and metaphorical of the realms, but also there are riches there if you, you know, figure out how to like extract them and become, you know, the owner of that domain. And I I love that idea. Like hell might have sort of like the last choice that anyone would choose in terms of what they, you know, are in charge of and where they dwell, but nothing is going to come between her and what's hers. No matter how lowly people considered it before they need something from her. Yeah, yeah. I think that's 100% accurate. Amanda, I love I love <laughs> how much we're vibing with hell here. Like she again, she's like while we know some specifics about her, she's not very like fleshed out. I, I hate to use the term fleshed out for someone yeah. who's like her flesh <laughs> is the like rotting corpses and but like no, she's an enigma that we can yes. like put our own, you know, thoughts, feelings, desires, repulsions onto. And I think that's true so often, especially of women figures in mythology because either they were, you know, used for whatever purposes the sort of like dominant culture, you know, had to instrumentalize or it was, you know, a figure that was kind of rendered two-dimensionally. And now we look back and say there must be more going on here. Or maybe the details are just kind of lost to time. But that's why I love when you surface these like very complex women characters from mythology because I take for granted that the, you know, Odins and Thors of the world get to have their complex journeys and contain multiple But for hell, sometimes it's, you know, the sketch of an outline or a negative space that we sort of get to relate to. And in some ways, that makes for a really compelling bond with a character, more so even, for me at least, than, you know, reading a whole anthology of stories about her, because she can be whatever I want her to be. That room is where I get to make my bond with her. Yeah, I think that's 100% true. And I think also 100% true of death. Death is an enigma for people who are kind of like creating these stories and these characters that embody death. Yeah. And so like the idea of like, yeah, it is a mystery and therefore that's why these gods don't have a lot of personality. Not even not a lot of personality, but like are very like just stoic in a way because again, like death doesn't care. Death is that great equalizer. Death is like There's no reasoning with it. And so I think that's why hell is so not filled in that way, because we simply don't know a lot about death and therefore a lot about the God that is in charge of it. 100%. So, Amanda, I love this little side quest that we've went on here with Hell, but we've got a lot of fun monsters and creatures to talk about as well. But first, how about we go and grab our refill? Let's do it. Hey, it's Julia, and welcome to The Refill. First off, we're going to start, of course, by thanking our newest patron, Melanie. Melanie, thank you so much for going to patreon.com slash spiritspodcast and joining up for the Patreon. You'll get cool rewards like ad-free episodes, recipe cards for every cocktail that we make here on the show, and so, so much more. And of course, Melanie joins the rank of people like our supporting producer-level patrons, Alicia and Brittany, Fruity Chick, Hannah. Anna, Jack Marie, Jane, Nieselkins, Lily, Matthew, Megan, Moon, Nathan, Phil Fresh, Rico Like, Captain Jonathan, Malachi Cosmos, Sarah, and Scott, and of course our legend level patrons Ariana, Audra, Bex, Chibi Okai, Morgan, Morgan H, Sarah, and Bia Me Up Scotty. And you too can be amazing like all of those people that I just listed right now by going to patreon.com slash spirits podcast and joining the Patreon today. Check it out. There's a lot of really great rewards. What I would like to recommend for you this week, of course, is, hey, pick up a beach read. I just really love the idea of reading outside, whether it's at the beach or in your backyard or in a park or what have you, just like reading outside when the weather is super nice 
something very digestible, something that you could power through and enjoy, no matter what the genre is. A lot of people tend to think of a beach read as like, oh, it's romance or it's very light. But like, I like a good beach read horror, something that I could like sit down and be like, ooh, spooky, but the weather's nice out, so I'm not too scared. A lot of times the library will have a whole section on beach reads, or you'll be able to go to a bookstore and be like, ah, yes, the beach read section. Let me check out what's there. Just pick up a nice book and read it outside. That's my recommendation for you this week. I also want to tell you that we have new merch for sale in our merch store. You can get five new tarot designs on a black t-shirt plus the updated logo t-shirt at spiritspodcast.com slash merch. If you haven't seen the tarot designs that we put out in our tarot deck, let me tell you, they are gorgeous. And now we have five of those designs available on a print-on-demand t-shirt. So you can get stuff like the Chunga moon card. You can get the star featuring Mothman. You can get a Baba Yaga one or a Tatterhood one go and check it out. That is at spiritspodcast.com slash merch. I also want to tell you about a show here on the Multitude Collective that I think you would like, and that is, of course, Games and Feelings. Games and Feelings is an advice podcast about games. You can join question keeper Eric Silver and a revolving cast of guests as they answer your questions at the intersection of fun and humanity, since, you know, you got to play games with other people. And we're talking about all types of games, video games of all stripes, tabletop games, party games, laser tag, escape rooms, so much more, anything you can think of really. Like answering questions like, how do you convince people who have only played Monopoly to play the new board game that you grabbed at the game store? Or is an escape room a good third date option? What makes a video game cozy are there recommendations? Of course there are, yes. And they also have Jasper Cartwright, who is an actor, D&D player, and the host of Three Black Halflings on as a permanent guest. So Eric, Jasper, and various multitude folks are there to recommend you games, answer advice questions, and play whatever quizzes Eric comes up with, which you know from experience. He's great at quizzes. So if you like what you hear and you want to level up your emotional intelligence stats, subscribe now wherever you get your podcasts. There are new episodes every Friday. Now, this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp, and I'm sure there are times where you have felt uncertain about where you're going in life or what the right path to take is and how to go through these really challenging times. And I think that a great way of doing that, of figuring out how to deal with decisions around career, relationships, all kinds of things, is by going to therapy. And therapy helps you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate your life. So you can move forward with confidence and excitement because you can bounce ideas off of someone who like feels impartial, who like knows you and knows how your mind works and can help you decide, okay, this is the best course of action for me. And trusting yourself to make decisions that align with your values is like anything else. The more you practice it, the easier it gets. And going to therapy is a great way of practicing it. So I know from my personal experience that therapy really does help in terms of creating positive coping skills for myself, teaching myself how to set boundaries, and like basically creating the best version of myself through these practices and talking to someone who knows how best to help. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash spirits today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash spirits. And we are also sponsored by Shaker and Spoon, a subscription cocktail service that helps you learn how to make handcrafted cocktails right at home. And listen, I've been spending a lot of time in cocktail bars because I love them and I love seeing what summer drinks these cocktail bars can come up with. And it's just like a delight. But 
every time I go to a cocktail bar, I'm like, okay, but I would love to make this at home, like in the comfort of my home, in my own kitchen, with all these like tinctures and stuff that I wouldn't normally know where to get. But Shaker and Spoon has you covered. Every box comes with enough ingredients to make three different cocktail recipes developed by world-class mixologists. All you need to do is buy one bottle of that month's spirit, and you have all you need to make 12 drinks at home. And at just $40 to $50 per month, plus the cost of a bottle, it is a super effective way to enjoy craft cocktails. And you can skip or cancel boxes at any time. So if they're doing like a rum box one month and you're just like, I just cannot drink rum, rum is not for me, you can skip or cancel that box, no problemo. So invite some friends over, class up your nightcaps, or be the best house guest of all time with your Shaker and Spoon box and get $20 off your first box at shakerandspoon.com slash cool. And now let's get back to the show. We are back, and for this one, kind of inspired by the fact that I told all of you to go buy Aquavit last time we had a It's Norse, of course, episode, I want to make sure that you're using it up. Uh, Very thoughtful of you. Thank you. I try my best. So here is a really simple cocktail that is called the Nordic Summer. It is just Aquavit. Aperol, which you probably already have because everyone's obsessed with Aperol spritzes this year, and lime juice. It is simple, tasty, bright, and bitter. You're going to love it. I've not found anything I've put lime juice in that has not benefited from lime juice, and I've really enjoyed. So I'm totally here for it. My worst days, Amanda, are when I check my fridge when I'm about to make a cocktail, and all I have are lemons and not limes. And I'm like, (sighs) dear God, it's just not the same. It's just Just not not. the same. It's just not. Also, shout out to my local grocery store, which constantly has deals where it's like, would you like eight limes for $2? And I said, yes, I would. Thank you very much. Yeah, I can go through eight limes in like three days. (laughs) It's it's not hard. Easily. And like they usually do like $2 for five lemons. And it's like, oh, just the deals, the deals that are happening there. Incredible. I now request Julia takes me to that supermarket when we visit her because it's so good. That's how good it is. Like, yeah. it's it's a constant stop for all my friends. Their produce is just so good. Like, highly recommend finding your local supermarket that has great produce. Like, I go there, and they have, like, cactus pears. I can get kumquats. I can get fresh guava. It's wild. Like, their pepper selection is out of this world. It's just, it's fantastic. Shout out. Shout out. So we left off talking about Hell, but let's talk about one of her monstrous siblings, who we've mentioned a couple of times already in our It's Norse, of course, episodes, and that is Fenrir. Fenrir. We know you well. The giant wolf Fenrir, whose name means he who dwells in the marshes, which (laughs) I love that. That's great. Just a wet wolf. Always smelling a little bit like wet dog. A little bit like wet dog. Probably a lot like wet dog. Probably a lot. like Probably worse, yeah, than wet dog, yeah. He is perhaps most famous for the story that is called The Binding of Fenrir, which we touched upon when we talked about Tyr recently. But when Fenrir was born, the gods of Asgard chose to raise him because they were concerned what might happen if he was allowed to run wild and because they were really nervous that he was going to just wreak havoc across the realms. However, Fenrir grew at a astonishing rate, a Mm -hmm. real reverse Benjamin Button, Amanda, as you like to say. Exactly. A.K.A. aging. Yep. A.K.A. aging, but at a fast rate. And eventually the gods realized that they just weren't going to be able to keep him in check without chaining him up. And they attempted this three times. The first two times, the gods told Fenrir that they were just playing a game, testing his strength. And when he broke out of his bonds easily, the gods started to get a little nervous. So they went to the dwarves and they asked them to forge the strongest chain ever built. But it also looked very light and was even soft to the touch, which I love that little detail. Be like, it was like basically like, you know, those, <laughs> you know, the fuzzy handcuffs. It was yes. like the equivalent of that, but like they were made of titanium underneath. <laughs> <laughs> With this in hand, they took Fenrir to the island of Lingvi and presented Fenrir with this third chain. But this time, Fenrir was a little suspicious. He's like, why do we keep playing this game where you, like, put chains on me and then I break out of them? Seems suspicious, actually. 
And as we talked about in our tier section, he refused to try on the bond unless one of the gods stuck their hand in his mouth as a sign of good faith. And Tyr was the only one brave enough to accept and lost his hand as a result because Fenrir soon found that he was unable to break free of the chain, which was known as Gleipnir. I love just the the Norse instinct to just name all objects. (laughs) Yes, yes. Amanda... I'll be quite honest with you. Every chain in this story does have a name. Great. But I'm just going to talk about Gleipnir because I think that's like the most important one. Cool. But Gleipnir was then attached to another chain, which was then fastened to a boulder, and a sword was placed between Fenrir's jaws to hold them open. No more snapping shut and biting off the arms of any of the gods. Useful. Useful. So howling furiously and unendingly, Fenrir's mouth began to drool which formed a foamy river called Vaughn, or Expectation. (laughs) What a name. What a name. That's one. Great Expectation. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Sorry. Amazing. Now, Amanda, there are several other wolves that are mentioned in the Eddas, and there is some agreement among scholars that they probably are just other names for Fenrir. But... Basically, it was said that there is a wolf that will swallow the sun during Ragnarok, which is sometimes attributed to Fenrir, and sometimes to a giant wolf named Skull, whose name means mockery. Oh. I'm just love the translations this episode are wild. Loving it. Yeah, seriously. There's also said to be another wolf named Garm, who will break free from chains at Ragnarok. Again, this is assumed to be Fenrir, just using a different name. Sure. There's also a wolf that will devour the moon named Managarmer, or Hati, which means hatred, which is also another assumed extension of Fenrir. And it is said that Fenrir is ultimately the one that will kill Odin during Ragnarok and will destroy much of the world, as well as we can assume, since all these wolves are probably Fenrir, swallow the moon and sun as well. I mean, if you're gonna kill Odin, you might as well eat the moon and the sun. Uh, I mean, let's be honest. Listen, I feel my strongest after I have a big meal. That's not true. I just get really sleepy. Um, <laughs> but if I was going to go into battle, I want to. I would want to go in, you know, with a big moon and sun delicious meal. Yeah. You know? And like the intimidation factor of your enemies being like, you did just kill Odin and eat the moon and the sun. That's a real advantage. Amanda, now famously, the moon is said to be made of cheese. Yes. So I assume if you were to bite the moon, it would taste like cheese. Yes. What do you think the sun tastes like? Uh, peppers. Hot sauce. Oh, interesting. I was thinking like citrus, Mm. like an orange juice maybe or something like that. That's true. But what if it's like, have you ever had like orange juice or like a cocktail that has orange juice, but it's also a little spicy, like they put some like cayenne in there or something like that? Yes, like a spicy blood orange margarita type situation. Yeah, I think that's what the sun tastes like. That'd be great. That would be delicious, wouldn't it? No notes. What are the other options besides cheese for the moon in your opinion? Oh, well, you have uh, a tortilla. Tortilla? (laughs) Yep. Okay. Like if you, when you, you know, get like a nice handmade tortilla, you got those like kind of nice brown spots from the griddle. Those are sort of like the moon craters. I also did learn recently, Julia, and by recently, I mean while falling asleep last night while listening to a podcast. And so my brain just fixated onto this fact, which is that the dust of the moon, like, you know how here on Earth, sand is like rocks that get swished around a lot until they're very round and like soft edge. They're essentially all like little spheres. Mm -hmm. On the moon, there's no water or weather to, like, swish everything around. So every piece of dust on the moon is incredibly sharp. (laughs) They're like (laughs) little tackers. Every single grain of the, like, silicate that is the face of the moon is incredibly sharp. Um, And that's why, like, when you make footprints on the moon, it's not just because there's no wind there, but it's also because it's like you're stepping into wet sand. If every particle of sand was, like, an irregularly shaped, very sharp diamond, which could kind of, like, interlock and just, like, hold its shape instead of sand, which, like, splooges back into space. Does that mean every step on the moon does a big crunch? I think it's big crunch, and I think it's like stepping on Legos. And actually, it makes making robots very hard because unlike sand, which could just sort of be like crushed to dust, you get some of that shit in your gears. Bad story. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So anyway, I'm thinking about the moon now as a big piece of rock candy Mm. that'll just 
tear up your mouth. But the rock candy is very, very fine. And so it looks smooth and you go, yum, yum. And then when you go to bite it, you're like, oh, no. It's Captain Crunch, Amanda. It's That's Captain what we're going Crunch. For. It's Captain, Captain Crunch, Crunch is what I'm saying. Yeah. All right. So Fenrir was not the only giant creature that was born of Loki and Engroboda. There was also the world serpent, the Midgard snake, the giant serpent, Jormungandr. Yay, our friend. Now, Jormungandr was said to have been cast into the sea by Odin, biting his own tail and encircling the earth, which there's something about an Ouroboros, a snake eating its own tail, that I love so much. Classic. It's great. Classic. Other than that awesome image, his biggest enemy among the gods was Thor. They hate each other. They truly do. So one story features Thor trying to catch the serpent using an ox head for bait. And he actually managed to ensnare Jormungandr with that bait. But at the time, while he's trying to reel the giant serpent in, he's spotted by the Jotun Hymir. Now, Hymir was concerned that pulling Jormungandr out of his spot in the sea would actually start Ragnarok. So he snipped Thor's fishing lines and Jormungandr disappeared once more into the sea. Wow. Kind of kind of a fun fishing story. Like, you'd be like, you guys will never believe what I almost, like, the line snapped. It's like that one scene in Jaws where um, Richard Dreyfus is trying to tell Quint, like, no, 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 that's, like, just a gaming fish, like a big tuna or yeah, a swordfish yeah. or something. And then it bites through the piano wire that <laughs> Quint was using to try to catch the shark. And he's like, oh, a gaming fish bit through this piano wire? Don't you tell me my business again. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> I like the movie Jaws. Did you know that? It's true. It's true. Do you have any merchandise related to that interest? Uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Maybe I do. <laughs> so the Norse people actually attributed some earthquakes to Jormungandr's movements beneath the sea. A lot of times we also talked about in the Loki episode that they were like, oh, earthquakes is just Loki moving around. But in this case... Also, Jormungandr, also the Midgard snake, you know. And there's actually references to Jormungandr and earthquakes being made well into the Middle Ages. So even after Christianity had come to Europe and kind of tried to convert all the people, people were still making references to this big snake and earthquakes. Hell yeah. Now, before we get to one of my favorites that we're going to be talking about in this episode that we haven't really gotten a chance to talk about yet, I want to address the elves and the dwarves of Norse mythology because we made some mention to them in past episodes. And I want to specify that like the elves and dwarves that we're talking about in Norse mythology are probably different from the ones that we think of when we're talking about the classic fantasy genre. Mm -hmm. And part of that is we just don't have a lot of information specifically for the elves in Norse mythology in surviving texts and also like it's kind of that looking back we tend to flavor things the way that we grew up with you know so like the way that fantasy genre portrays things we assume that's the way that they've always been portrayed but that's not the case yeah and the sort of like Tolkien tradition. Exactly. Especially when we're talking about Norse mythology. And while Tolkien did take a lot of inspiration from Norse mythology in general, this version of the dwarves and the elves are, in fact, very different than, like, classic Lord of the Rings mythos. I honestly don't even know what those figures would... Like, my brain is so shaped by that template that I'm excited to hear what we do know and what those could, like, physically look like. So the dwarves are distinct in Norse mythology as being not as beautiful as the gods of Asgard, which is fair because, like, as we talked about, the dwarves don't have those golden apples that the Asgardians are constantly eating to make them both young and beautiful. Like, that's totally fair that no one's going to be as hot as them because they're not eating magic apples. Yeah. Whatever. Fine. <laughs> it's such a, like a bias where it's like, oh, well, you know, they were ugly because they weren't as beautiful as the Asgardians. I'm like, they literally had like magic, like Botox, basically. Yeah. It's like comparing yourself to Instagrams of celebrities, which is like, yeah, you had a glam team and your job is uh, being beautiful <laughs> in large part. And also like you have filters and stuff like exactly. that. Dwarves didn't have any Instagram filters mm -mm. to put on. No filter life. So it was said that the dwarves were born from the giant Ymir's dead body and that after that they were, took up residence in the realm of Spartalfheim. 
The gods gave them domain over the underground treasures of the realms, so the precious metals and the gems, which naturally kind of led itself to the fact that they were master craftsmen. And as we've talked about in previous episodes, they fashioned many treasures for the gods, including like Mjolnir, the ship that could be folded up and put away, Mm -hmm. the flying golden boar, etc., etc. Yes, all the things that we would definitely choose to have in real life if we could. Yes, exactly. They were also sometimes said to turn to stone if they were exposed to the light of the sun. But again, like that's not every story because I'm sure there are versions in the Eddas where it's like this dwarf was like fully just like out in the sun. Like he didn't like just come here at night. The whole story didn't take place at night. That's wild, you know? Right. So the Poetic Edda actually lists many of the dwarves' names, but here are some of my favorites that I think are worth mentioning because I just like their little stories and I like their little names. Okay. First off is Brock and Itri or Sindri. Itri and Sindri are like used interchangeably in the Eddas. They were the dwarven brothers who made those items for the gods after that bet with Loki who wanted to take his head and also created Mjolnir, which is like kind of pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Also like my favorite side characters in the God of War games. Big fans of them. (laughs) There is Davlin, who was the one that made Freya's famous golden necklace, but was also turned to stone at dawn when he presented it to her. Like, he, like, was working on it all night, and when he finally handed it over, he got turned into stone because of the sun. Bummer. There is Anvari, who was one that had a magical ring that helped him become wealthy, but was tricked by Loki into giving up his golden hoard, and Loki basically stole his ring from him. Kind of sucks, but that's classic Loki there. It is also said that there are four dwarves, Nordi, Sudri, Ostri, and Vestri, who held up the four corners of the sky, which, as you might remember, was made up of the skull of the giant Ymir. Wow, important. Yeah, they also represent the cardinal directions, the four winds, like a bunch of different things, which I really like. Obviously, you look at their names, you're like, oh, that's just north, south, east, west, yeah. basically, more or less. <laughs> basically. You're like, all right, we see you, we see you. We love it. And then there are the elves. So they are from the realm of Alfheim and are beings with magical abilities. And while they're often mentioned in the Eddas, they don't often play an active role in the events that happen. Like there's several mentions of elves. Like in particular, I'm thinking of the story where Loki has that rap battle where he kind of insults everyone in the hall for like not inviting him. Mm -hmm. There's mentioned that like elves are there, but like they don't play an active role in the events that are happening. Gotcha. Now, there are also light elves and dark elves, but they don't really have that kind of implication of light and dark equaling good and evil the way that we think of today. They're just like two kind of distinct races of elves and like that's it. And while they don't feature heavily in the Eddas, there is definitely evidence that the elves were given sacrifices in Norse society. This was called the Alpha Blot, and this is a sacrifice made to the elves towards the end of autumn and was a local celebration at homesteads, mainly administered by the women of the household. Right on. Which I think is kind of interesting. And it's particularly like, we don't know the details, and it's assumed that most homesteads, every different homestead had kind of a different ritual around it. Sure. Because it was very secretive, you wouldn't like invite people who didn't live in the homestead into this kind of sacrifice and celebration because it was like specifically for that home and for that family. Right on. I love that. So that's really all we know about elves in Norse mythology, unfortunately. They're just kind of around, but they don't feature very heavily in the actual lore of the Norse gods, which is what the Eddas primarily focus on. So we don't have a lot of surviving relics and surviving stories that feature heavily in the elves. And that leads us finally to the Valkyries, the choosers of the slain. Yay! Saving the best for last, in my opinion. So as you might recall, they are the attendants of Odin. They wait on the tables and keep the drinks flowing in his hall, Valhalla. But their most important job is going to the mortal battlefield and deciding who wins and who dies. And in the aftermath of battle, they carry the brave dead back to Valhalla to join Odin's hall. And as Edith Hamilton puts it, love our girl, shout out to Edith (laughs) Hamilton, 
a hero doomed on the battlefield would see, quote, maidens excellent in beauty, riding their steeds in shining armor, solemn and deep in thought, with their white hands beckoning. God, Edith just has a way with words. I, I know. love her so much. I really wish I could talk to Edith at like 15, like the weird teen that would become Edith Hamilton. Yes, you know? yes. I want to talk to her at like 50, where she like has her like lifetime companion at that point yes. and like had just adopted a son and yeah, like yeah. is teaching at like a university. Like, God bless Edith Hamilton. Love her so much. Love you. So as described by our girl Edith Hamilton, the Valkyries would go to Midgard in full armor with their gold hair flying from underneath the winged helmets that they wore. Mm. They would hover over the warriors chosen to die in the thick of battle, and when they finally passed, the Valkyrie would sweep him up and carry him on horseback back to Asgard. Mm. Incredible. Just like a beautiful image, you know? I can see why people were like, yes, I want to die a glorious death on the battlefield because this afterlife seems tight as hell. Uh, the dying part, not great. What came afterward? Love it. Not going to say worth it was worth it. it, but like maybe it was worth it. I mean, it might be worth it. Like a hot lady <laughs> picks me up and like takes me to a hall where all I get to do is eat and drink for the rest of my days. Love it. And then I get to die in another battle when Ragnarok comes around. We love to see it. Hell Yeah. So the number of Valkyries changes depending on the source. Sometimes there are six, nine, or 13 at the most. And some of my favorite translations for their names are, now, Amanda, this is a real, like, tag yourself situation, right? Okay, I'm ready. Shrieker, Screamer, Storm Razor, Axe Time, (laughs) Spear Bearer, Shield Bearer, and Mist. Oh, I want to be Axe Time, but I'm Mist. I'm Mist. That's the answer. I'm thinking I'm Storm Razor. Yeah. That feels about right. That's I mean, anything Razor is going to be great, Julia. Like, I yeah. wish I could call my job, like, Audiophile Razor. Like, that doesn't that sound better? Amanda, you can. No one is stopping you. <laughs> you could put that That's on fair. a business card. I could. We could also translate it to Old Norse and then, like, see where you're at there. Hell yeah, dude. Someone who speaks or writes Old Norse, please translate a name that means Audiophile Razor. Frankly, I'll take any language. Yeah. You know, you know, yeah. Working on my Hebrew, I could try that. Love it. That would be impressive. I'd like it. But I like the idea of like a not spoken anymore or like dead language, like translating, like, what would an audiophile be? What would you translate that to? <laughs> exactly. So in some stories, Freya is said to be the leader of the Valkyries, and as we discussed in her episode, she would choose the best of the best to join her hall before the rest were kind of sent to Odin in Valhalla. So when the Valkyries served in Valhalla, they apparently, instead of full armor, wore beautiful gowns, would eat and serve from a eternal boar named Sihrimhir, and would drink never-ending mead from the udders of the goat Hydrum. Wow. That's a party. Now, can we talk about this eternal boar? Yes. And, like, again, they don't, like, specify that it's a boar, but, like, most scholars agree, like, since we're talking about it, like, basically they're using the word for pork when describing the dish that they would make of this animal. Yeah. But it was, like, this thing would be killed and, like, stewed in a big pot. Sure. And then served to the people of Valhalla every day. And then... The next morning, it would be alive again, and they'd have to slaughter it again and cook it again and then feed it again. I mean, you are describing uh, torture, and I don't love that. (laughs) So I'm going to focus instead on the goat, what has meat out of its titties. Yeah. I imagine before all that, it probably leads like a really good like morning and noontime life. Like they're probably feeding it very well and like, you know, taking a lot of care of it. And then it does get made into a dish. This is kind of like we talked about in our Thor episode way, way back where he has those goats that he'll sometimes eat and then they come back to life. Again, is it better than not coming back to life? Ooh, mm-hmm. I don't know how to answer that. Yeah. So the Valkyries were also said to be the daughters of various gods and goddesses, Odin included. And Odin granted some of the Valkyries the ability to transform into swans. But if Valkyries were seen by a human without her swan disguise while she was on Midgard, she would become mortal and would never be able to return to Valhalla. Damn. Which is a little sad. Brutal. Yeah. That's like being like, yeah, you can go to the human world and kind of like do your thing. But like if anyone sees you, that's bad. That's bad. Yeah. 
I don't love that. Yeah, I don't love that either. So when they're not retrieving the dead from Midgard or serving in Valhalla, we know that the Valkyries are constantly preparing for the events of Ragnarok because as Odin servants, they know that it is coming. So they are constantly just like getting ready to fight the big fight that they know inevitably is going to come. Wow. And with that, Amanda, I think that's the perfect segue into our next It's Norse, of course, episode, where we're going to be talking about the end of the world. We're going to be talking about Ragnarok. And is it the final episode of the series? Hmm, who can say? Ooh, maybe not an end, maybe just the beginning, we don't know. That's the cycle of Norse mythology, baby. You never know. You never know where it's going to be. I can't wait for that episode. But Julia, I was I was struck by inspiration ah, during this episode. And wonderful. I did cast some of the favorite characters from uh, today's roundup as leftovers. Wonderful. We're going to begin with Hell, where she, of course, kind of takes care of the cast offs. Mm. And I would like to propose to you that Hell is a frittata, Ooh. a dish where you can take lots of just like the random stuff that is around in your fridge, make it into, you know, a dish that can then, you know, move forward and does smell a little bit like death of just the, the smell of egg leftovers. Yeah. Just kind of on the edge. Yeah. Egg leftovers, you know. I think when, like, baked and maybe eaten cold are best, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't, like, reheat egg leftovers. That's, like, my personal feeling yeah. about that. And I, I know a lot of people who are, like, ooh, like, the texture or the appearance of, like, scrambled eggs or eggs in certain forms, like, not for me. That's the closest I want to get to, like, casting hell's skin as a food. So okay. that was that. All right. Awesome. Next, we have uh, Fenrir, where, of course, you're, as you said, like concerned about what might happen if you let him go too wild. Mm -hmm. And so my suggestion for this is actually salt, where it's something I love, always glad it's around, but you can easily get to a point where the dish is kind of like unsalvageable or like the salt ah. is like running rampant and you really can't combat it. You can attempt to with like sugar or with acid. So mm -hmm. that was my brain blast about Fenrir. Interesting. Interesting. I like that. I think Fenrir is also like has the energy of like trying to reheat a fried food. Ooh, yes. You know, a mozzarella stick, a French fry. Mm -hmm. And like there are ways there are ways, but <laughs> sometimes they just end up floppy and gross. And I think of that river of drool that is coming out of Fenrir's mouth. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, that's just that's soggy, baby. Uh, brilliant. Revising my revising my notes perfect um your mm -hmm. is a thanksgiving turkey wow okay just big and you're like what do i do with this and you have to break it down and figure out how it's going to fit in your fridge yes no that makes a lot of sense to me for sure and like you're like there are so many options i can do with this i can make a hash i can make sandwiches i could just reheat it the way that it is like in a little uh, container yep. like with all the other sides and stuff like that exactly yeah, there's a lot of options Amazing. The dwarves are going to be chicken thighs. They are the workhorses of my meal prep routine. Yes. They are so nutritious, lots of flavor in there, and a really good like thing to have. Sometimes, like again, no worse smell than rotten chicken. I'm imagining kind of the turning to stone here, mm -hmm. or like even cooked chicken smells like farts sometimes. And I'm like, why is this happening to me? Anyway, so chicken thighs, lots of richness, lots of nutrients, uh, very versatile. And once you master how to cook them, it's like, why would you ever cook anything else? I, I love chicken thighs. May I yes end you? Please. And suggest a supermarket rotisserie chicken. I was considering the Costco chicken versus mm. the chicken thigh. I think that's great. What inspires you about that? So I am a kind of person who I sometimes struggle to have the energy to cook things or like reheat them. Mm -hmm. And like I have no desire to do so. And I think that like just <laughs> this is going to sound gross. Just peeling little pieces off oh, yeah. a rotisserie chicken and stuffing those in my mouth is like the amount of energy that sometimes I can exert in creating a like leftover meal for myself. 100%. And then and when you're done with it, talking about the workhorse of the leftovers thing, you can make stock out of it, baby. You sure with can. With the, the bones. You sure can. Yeah. Perfect. With the bones. The elves, Julia, gave me a little more consternation. And it feels like we don't know a lot about them. Mm -hmm. When they are there, you're like, oh. And there is a specific time of year that we focus a lot on them. Our elves canned pumpkin, where... If you looked at, like, the American historical record of recipes, mm -hmm. you're not going to see a lot. But sometimes you're like, what was that holiday all about the pumpkin? <laughs> and you figure it out from there. I don't know. That, that was my thought. That was my thought. But, like, what are you going to do with half a can of canned pumpkin? Like, uh, it's it's tough. 
I think of the elves as, and this might just be a me household thing. Okay. But the bag of little packets of condiments that are stuffed in my fridge. Do you know my first guess was Worcestershire sauce? Because I'm like, I don't know, I need it twice a year, but... Uh. <laughs> no, but like the fire sauce from Taco Bell, the, the soy sauce packets, soy sauce yep. packets, exactly, sweet and sour sauce. Sometimes like the little like ketchup things, if we're like out of ketchup and I'm like desperate for like yes. some sort of ketchup and I don't have it, I'm just like... Or like a single Smucker's jelly pack from a diner takeout. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. That's what the elves are. Incredible. We got there. And then lastly, Julia, I have the Valkyries, which are that wonderful thing where you go to a grandparent's or maybe a parent's house, maybe some especially good friends, and then on the way out the door, they give you leftovers you did not expect to take with you. Mm. And maybe like Eric's grandma once did, she gives you a Ziploc bag filled with frozen chicken cutlets that can just be in your freezer and last you and taste, you know, different and especially delicious. Or maybe it's, you know, oh, you know, we ate the meal and then grandma had already put aside, you know, a couple Tupperwares for you. And just like an incredible reward at the end of the day, incredibly nourishing, incredibly uh, wonderful, not just food, but more. That to me is the grandma leftover. That is the dream. Yeah. And nary a Italian dinner where someone in the group text that is inviting you over says, and remember to bring your Tupperware. Exactly. <laughs> and then you do. And then you Beautiful. do. And then you have sauce for thing. like three weeks. Yeah. Amazing. Amanda, that was a wonderful summary for the end here. I really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you so much. Of course. Well, I loved this episode, Julia, and I can't wait to learn more about Ragnarok. It's been looming or perhaps already loomed, perhaps will loom in the future. We'll see. Yeah. And one final thing before we close out the episode. This is Eric Schneider's last episode working on spirits. We wish him all the best as he leaves to focus on his full-time job. And thank you for your hard work over all these years. Yes, thank you so much. And remember, as you face the cyclical end of the world, stay creepy. Stay cool. Stay cool.